Greetings and welcome to Outlaws to the End. This is the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com, the greatest gaming community on this planet. This is the show where we talk in depth about the video game industry and whether or not we are wearing pants while that happens is a matter of optimistic speculation. I'm Brent Adams, joined as always by my friend, the legend that is Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren, Brent. Adams, how the hell are you? Man, it's great to be back with you. How you doing, buddy? You know, I'm well, man. I'm well. Your your uh your opening is actually uh quite appropriate. As literally ten minutes before we got on the call, I said to my wife, I should probably put some pants on because Brent and I use Skype now. <laughs> That'd be the perfect reason to not put your pants on, Lauren. That was for you, my friend. How the hell are you? I'm great, dude. I'm great. This is, this is us pretending online that we've never spoken since the last show. Yeah, exactly. Or that we haven't been talking for the last hour. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm doing great, man. I'm I'm busy. I'm I'm very yes. busy, but uh, I'm very happy, and uh, and that makes all the difference. Indeed. I, uh, how's how's Zeely? Zeely is great. She's uh, I can hear her right now. She's upstairs playing with her birthday present from her grandparents, which is a new train table for her her wooden train uh, track toys. She's a very big fan of. She likes uh, she likes putting the tracks together and stuff. Kind of sort of like a puzzle. She loves puzzles. Did you and uh, Lego and things like that? Have you gotten her 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 my first podcast set? <laughs> No, but uh, I- interestingly enough, um, she and I were she were she was helping me hang pictures today, and I was just thinking like I'm remiss as a father in that she doesn't have her first like my tool set, uh, which yes. she clearly needs because uh, she was uh, she was doing very good ferrying back and forth between me and my tool bag to you know bring me the hammer and the the drill and all that kind of stuff as we were we were hanging up family and friend photos and stuff so. Uh, not not interested in podcasting yet. Showing some some perhaps some early signs of interest in music, um, but we'll wait and see how that pans out. Excellent, man. Excellent. Well, uh, I'm glad to be back here on the podcast. I know I know people are uh, you, you kind of see it some of the comments uh, every once in a while. There's a, a swell of so when's the next podcast, guys? And I, yeah. to be fair, uh, you know, I mean, we of course did say when we ended uh, Outlaw Gamer Radio that we were going to sort of do podcasts whenever we felt like it and whenever the the uh, emotion moved us to do so but we have done it a little bit less than i anticipated we would i think because both of us just you know are busy and have our own lives which is part of why we stopped doing the podcast in the beginning um, true enough so i think uh, i think people i'm hopeful people will be excited we put up a poll we'll talk about that later and i'm hopeful that uh, i have a feeling we will be doing something uh for e3 whatever that is i don't we yeah. haven't uh, talked about it yet, but I have a feeling we will be doing something for E3. I feel almost certain. Uh, that's true. So that'll be exciting. But I'm excited to talk games with you, man. I feel like it's been forever. When I was putting together the the um, agenda for the show or the the document for the show, I thought it's so odd to put it together now because it's been so long. Yeah. Uh, since we, you know, the last show, of course, we did was a uh, post mortem. Um, yeah, that was like and it's the, been long enough that that it, the division. Yeah, it was for the division. It's been long enough that that. Uh, I thought, God, there. What do we talk about? Do we talk about stuff that's three months old. I don't know, but uh, we we had to start by talking about Brent. Uh, I think because we haven't talked about it on the air. It's the most important um, story of the last eight months. So, might and, as well and talk frankly, about it. I, part of the reason we haven't talked about it is because I don't. I didn't. I haven't wanted to give it any real uh, weight because I won't be able to stand uh, the anticipation. But I think it's time that we talk about Red Dead Redemption Two and the trailer they put out. All right. So here's the things that you need to know. I think it's coming out this year, and everyone else on planet Earth thinks it's not. Yeah, I know. Everybody's saying that. Everybody's convinced that it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to be delayed. It'll be next spring at the least. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I could be wrong. Maybe it's maybe it's just uh, my optimism getting the better of me. But uh, I really want to think that we're going to see this game this fall when Rockstar says we're going to see it. Um, as for the trail, I mean, I I don't know what to say about it. I mean, I. I I don't think about it all that much because if I do, I'll drive myself insane because I can't play it. And did you go back and pr- and watch it again before, oh, yeah. like oh, yeah. yesterday or whatever? Um, yeah, I did too, and I watched it three times. And I, every time, I just like I just was giddy. Yeah. Like I could feel it inside my body. I was giddy with excitement. I, I can feel this swell of emotion. You know, just thinking about you know playing Red Dead. What a what a 
cornerstone kind of gaming experience that was. Uh, you know, you and I talking about it, and I think that that was really our first kind of post mortem. Although we weren't ta- we weren't calling them that at that time, back right. when we were doing the Axe Factor. Um, but um, I, I mean, that game looms very large in our minds and a lot of a lot of other people's as well, minds and hearts. So the the anticipation for the sequel is pretty profound, and then you kind of start getting into the speculation about, you know, what does it mean that the player you know, or that the poster shows these, you know, these these numerous figures? Does this point towards co-op multiplayer throughout the entire game? And you know, uh, you know, what's the what's the the multiplayer mode going to be like this time around in light of you know what GTA Five has done and on and on and on and you know that's the kind of stuff I try to stay away from because I'll just drive myself nuts um you know building up the game in my mind yeah you know when I was rewatching it I you know the the those the seven so it's, it takes place pre John Marston yeah right in the era right before John Marston um uh, when, when I was rewatching it I, and you see those seven figures sort of at the, sort of at the end riding away mm. I couldn't help but think about so a, a couple of things but uh, I recently saw Hateful Eight not too recently but um, and of, and the Magnificent Seven and and of course um, the remake so kind of the was, original Magnificent the remake the remake um, okay. um, and but I think back to GTA Five so Red Dead was was so seminal and, and G, then comes GTA Five as their next game which is just a, another just. Uh, Industry leading game, just incredible yeah. game. I mean, yeah. absolutely phenomenal game. And I remember when GTA Five was announced, and they were they were, they were doing the media leading up to it. We found out about the switching between the three characters. I thought that is a gimmick. That is stupid. I, I don't really see how that's going to work. And it it worked so wonderfully in the game. I loved 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 the ability to switch back and forth between Trevor and Michael and Franklin whenever you felt like it, mm. and that you switch back and forth between them. Even at times, you know, just the story drove you that way because you were having these like three really interesting experiences that f- almost felt like different games or certainly felt different narratively yeah. in the same amazing, amazing world. And I'm wondering if the seven represents something like that. Um, Entirely possible. If the mechanic is, is going to be jumping back and forth. So yeah, man, I don't know. I, I, am I, am I, does rockstar have a history of delaying games? They've, I mean, it's happened. Yeah. Um, it's definitely happened, but, um, I think I, I'm my memory is going to be fuzzy, and I, someone in the audience will correct correct the record. I'm sure. For some reason, I'm thinking that GTA Four w- went through uh, went went through a delay or two, but um, but like I said, I, I may be I may be misremembering. But I just I have I I I, I don't know why, but I have the sense of like of any company that I expect to stick to their date. I feel like. I feel like Rockstar would be it because they don't fuck around with with um, with marketing and advertising. I mean, they not, had no the real reason, way, you know. They're they're certainly in the part of the reason we're talking about this now. Uh, you know, when we get further in the show, we're going to talk about E3. I'm sure this game won't be at E3, or at least ev- everything historically indicates that it won't. I be. disagree, but we'll wait till. Oh, we you get think to, it'll be there? I think it will, but we'll get to the E3 section, and I'll tell you why I think that. Oh, that's interesting because Rockstar's not usually there, and so yeah. They, they, um, you know, they, they had no need necessarily to, I don't know. I just, I just have a feeling it's coming out this fall too, uh, as they said. So, so the other piece of course, Brent, which is unfortunate is that there was no mention, uh, or no mention at all of a PC version of the game. No, no, there's uh, not, which, uh, I mean, I suppose the, um, the, the one perhaps silver lining you could take away is that maybe that's something that they're going to hold on to, to make a big splash you know, in the media, uh, with the, you know, they're, they're going to hold that piece of information until they feel like they can kind of drop it with maximum impact maybe, but, uh, I don't, I don't feel like they they would do that because oh, unless they gave you the ability to cancel your pre-order, <laughs> there is that of course, because I mean, because people yeah. ostensibly are pre-ordering it on console right now, because that's what their option is. And if they then announce it, you know, in September that there is also a PC version, people, like myself would probably cancel their yeah. or want to cancel their console version. So I have a feeling, and it really bothers me actually that they just don't outright a- address it and just tell us what their plans are. Because you know I might hold off on the game if it's coming in in February or March on PC. Yeah, um, I, I would e- easily, easily I would. 
Yeah, so I'm not sure why they're so cagey about it. I would it, but easily wait. I, what I meant to say was I would easily buy it twice, which is what I would do. Right, which is what I was going to say. I, I don't know that I would be able to wait if it was that long. If it was a few weeks, I would. But um, anyway, I dude, I watch just watching watching the game, uh, the trailer again, over and over. It, it, I mean, it just looks amazing, and I'm I am dying the, the the for more media on it. I mean, we've got to be yeah. close to the time, whether it's in May or whether it's at E3 or shortly thereafter, where we start seeing some media on this game. Yeah, I I think that we're going to see. I think that we're going to see. A bit more on it soon. I think that what we're probably going to see is they're going to start up with the whole kind of uh, I, I don't remember what they called them, but you know, like that whole kind of series of like developer insight videos where they would they would just walk you through like some yep. aspect of the game's mechanics or whatever. Yep. I, I think that we'll start seeing those pretty soon, and I'm guessing that they'll do one on a relatively regular basis up to release. I hope I hope that's the case. Those are that's some of the best. I mean, I remember you and I yeah. doing shows on just that those pieces of media, those little so three effective. to four minute. So effective. absolutely, yep, yeah. indeed. All right, All so right. Uh, I could we can keep talking about that oh, if yeah. you want. Let's talk about prey. Why don't you tell me why I should care? Uh, <laughs> well, you should care because it just came out a couple of days ago. Yeah, it so came out it's, like it's, what, yeah, yesterday, didn't it? Like the fifth. Uh, oh, it? actually, at the time of the recording, yeah, it did come out yesterday. It came out on a Friday. Yeah. Uh, uh, oddly, um, but not oddly for Europeans, I suppose. But did you play the demo, Brent? I did not. No. So there is a demo. There, there currently is a demo. Uh, this is a game from Arcane Studios, the uh, the uh, studios that brought us Dishonored and Dishonored Two. Yeah. Um, which are which I didn't play the second one, but the first one I just was not a fan of. Uh, but many many people were. Yeah. Were. DK um, notably, he loved loved Dishonored. He did. Um, so uh, Prey came out, and I played the demo. Um. And I, you know, I was curious. You've seen the trailer, obviously. Is I this have. a game you're interested in, Brent? Not terribly. I, I mean, I have to say, like, it, I mean, there's nothing like wrong with it. Like, I'm not looking at it and go and you know, I don't have any critique of it. It's just that for whatever reason, it's not grabbing me and saying you need to play me. I'm not getting that reaction to it, or having that so reaction the, to it. Excuse me. The reviews that are out so far, there's not many uh, reviews out because, in t- typical Bethesda fashion, uh, they did not send out any review copies. Yep. So the reviewers had to pick it up day and date, and they're working on them now. But many of the review, the reviews so far have been quite good. Uh-huh. Um, many of them are saying that it. Um, I, I've read a couple of reviews that specifically said where Bioshock was supposed to be a spiritual successor to System Shock. Uh, that Prey has actually done a better job of that than Bioshock. Did. Ah, interesting. Well, I, um, I I get that. I mean, like in, in the trailer, like you know, you kind of feel that. Uh, you feel that those ideas might be running through the game. So that's, yeah, what I that's thought cool. was weird. So I played, they put out the demo on Xbox and PlayStation. They did not, for whatever reason, put out a demo on PC, although the game is on available on PC. Okay. Um, and I, I, so I played it on PS4 and I, I was, a, I, I really struggled with the, um, with the demo. It wasn't the, the graphics looked very old to me. Mm-hmm. It was very odd. There were some places in which it was quite beautiful. There's some places in which it was quite old. Um, and the gameplay just in that first hour did not feel all that compelling to me. Um, it, I, I definitely felt the Dishonored in it, uh, which I was not a big fan of. Um, and, and I don't know, you know, there's there are several outlaws playing it right now uh, who have said good things about it, but I was very unimpressed with the demo and it left me n- almost not interested in the game. I mean, I think I will play it when I when I can play it on PC and when I can pick it up for... 20 bucks or something on a steam sale. Right. Um, but yeah, I like you, it just, there was just nothing about it that has grabbed me. Well, uh, I guess we'll find out if that changes or not. Um, the, so speaking of things that aren't grabbing you, <laughs> um, is, and there's, is a, that I, your I'm segue? Not gonna ma- is that how you're going to play this? I'm not going to make a wife joke here. <laughs> um, but the third thing we wanted to talk about in this first section, uh, I, I kind of want to talk about was games we haven't played because there's been a, there's been a couple of this big ones already. A sad commentary on where we are in our lives, Lauren. I'm just going to warn you now. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'm certainly uh, uh, playing a little bit less games, but uh, well, uh, a little bit less games and and been more focused on like one or two specific games. That's me. Um, I'm a lot more focused these days. But uh, there's been a couple of big titles that came out that we, that I, neither one of us played, uh, and that is Horizon Zero Dawn and Mass Effect Andromeda. Yeah. 
Um, I did. I did rent Horizon from Redbox and play about an hour of it. Okay, that's cool. Um, I would have probably picked up Horizon Zero Dawn if I had a PlayStation in the house right now. Um, but uh, since I am console less at the moment, uh, it was not. It was not an option. But you know, I'm gonna have a console sometime this year. It, it's it's a given that it will happen. Um, I'm ninety percent certain right now that it's going to be a PS4 Pro. But I am hedging my bets a bit. A bit. I'm going to wait until E3. I'm going to see what Microsoft has to offer with Scorpio and see if there's enough there that might change my mind. But considering that what I'm really interested in playing on my PlayStation 4 Pro is Horizon Zero Dawn and the new Uncharted and God of War, you know, and so on and so and Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, well, that's not a console exclusive, so that doesn't count. But th- the point is that there's a bunch of Sony exclusives that I really, really do want to play. So I imagine Detroit become human. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I've actually got that on my list to talk about in, uh, in the E3 segment, but, uh, um, yeah, and as well as, uh, that other, that other zombie one is a PlayStation exclusive. Don't something. I can't remember the name of it. Days gone is what it's called. Yeah, that's it. Uh, the point is that I will very likely pick up horizon zero dawn along with my PS4 pro whenever I get it. Lance, uh, what about Lance uh, played Zelda? It, and I heard quite a bit about it, and uh, I thought uh, I, I liked. I I definitely was encouraged by what he had to say about it. Zelda, that's well, kind of a big game. I don't have a Switch, so I know I'm not playing it. Listen, when, um, when Tony when Tony Grice tells me I should buy a Nintendo Switch, I'll go buy one. Because and what, as to what his TG said, Tony is very, very skeptical about the Switch. I think he's pretty interested to see what they do at E3 and see if they uh, bring the content. He feels right now that their the catalog for the Switch is really thin in terms of games that interest him. We should bring him on the next show, Brent. All right, I'll Who's a- that guy. I'll ask him God if he's. It. I'll ask him if he's doing something. I want to see. I it. said I wouldn't do this. <laughs> Not to mention, so if we their- go another E3 and don't talk about Nintendo at all, <laughs> that'll just be. I, I think somebody's going to revolt because I was looking at the E3 preview and I was reading up on the E3 preview, and I did what I always do when I prep for E3 which and when I talk about it. Past the Nintendo which is just skip. That's exactly right, yeah. and I feel bad for our listeners because many of our listeners uh, have have uh, Nintendo consoles, and I'm sure it's uh, infuriating. And they're like, "Oh, great, they're not talking about the goddamn Nintendo again." Yeah. Um, well, yeah, another I mean, one was I Persona talk 5 knowledgeably, so you'd just be disappointed with me. That's true. Uh, another game we didn't play that I want to throw out there that I, that is that people who are playing it are saying amazing things about it okay. is Persona 5. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I also have heard really amazing things about Persona 5. What's yeah. the point of this segment again? That was just, I just, there were a lot of big titles I felt like that we haven't touched and uh, But as long as we say uh, their names in the show then we're 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 golden. Uh, in some way or another, we're acknowledging them. That's correct. Because I know people are going to be super excited to know that we didn't play games like Persona 5 and Horizon Zero Dawn <laughs> because we've been playing Ghost Recon for 250 hours. Yeah, that happens. That, that will occasionally happen to you. <laughs> um, anyway, all right. So let's move on to our E3 preview, Brent. You want to start with, you've got the poll in here. I don't know if you actually want to, re- want to read these results, but you know, we asked you guys what, uh, what we ought to talk about. And, um, what, you know, we, we initially were like, Hey, let's do a ghost recon wildlands postmortem because we managed to both play ghost recon wildlands, which doesn't happen very often. Uh, and <laughs> Lawrence, and then nobody wanted to Lawrence hear it. Said, well, why don't we do a poll and ask people what they want to hear? And it's a good thing we did that because nobody gave a fuck about the ghost recon wildlands postmortem. The wildlands postmortem had zero votes for a long time. And yeah. I'm not entirely sure it, that the per- the 4% it does have didn't come from you. Um, listen, I'm not going to answer that question uh, on the advice of my attorney. <laughs> I will say that I will say that ghost recon wildlands won only it, it only was managed to it only managed to defeat the other category. <laughs> so that tells you what you need to know. That's right. The point is that what you guys did say that you were interested in was doing a regular style show. You showed some interest in 2017 in gaming, and of course an E3 preview. So uh, we're we're going to try to kind of hit on uh, on all those things. As far as the E3 preview goes, Lauren, I thought what we might do is play a little uh, a little E3 bingo here. Okay. And let's just go back and forth briefly and talk about what we personally, not what we think we're going to see at E3, 
But let's talk personally about what we want to see from either. What are we excited to see going into this year's show? I'll start with <laughs> the Star Wars Visceral game. We had the briefest of previews last year. Just a little bit of footage. But um, I think that we're going to see something from it. And I desperately want to see something from it. I want to see something substantial from this uh, Amy Hennig written. Or actually, is she, is she the creative director on it? I can't remember. Anyway, Amy I Hennig is involved either. with this Star Wars Visceral game. And I want to know more about it. We know that we're going to see Star Wars Battlefront 2. No big surprise there. I hope Star Wars Battlefront 2 is everything we hope Star Wars Battlefront 1 would be. Yep. Because I will play the bejesus out of that game. But uh, I really want to see whatever this uh, narrative-driven Star Wars game that Visceral's working on is. So that's my first. Are we expecting to see that, Brent? Do you know? Is, it, is there, uh, has there been talk? I, th- that, that's the thing. I don't know. Like, and none, none of these things that I'm mentioning, none of this is based on you know, like what I think is likely. I'm just telling you what I want. Yeah. Um, in terms of the likelihood of this, I'd say 50-50. Yeah. So okay. So I'll go next, but and I and I'm not going to try to steal your thunder. So I'm welcome to. I'm happy to toss the ball back to you. But all right, Red Dead Redemption would be my number one. There you um, go. What I want to see the the only reason I actually put the trailer at the top and and was because I wasn't intending to talk about it because I, Rockstar has not really uh, brought a game to E3 and particularly one that the, the, around which there has been almost no discussion. Yeah. Or, or, or no media. To this point, I, historically, they don't do that. And so I, I had no expectations. If I was going to give this a percentage, I would just say that there's, in my mind, that there's a, a 5% chance of it being there. I don't know. Are, are you thinking differently? Yeah, here's what, I, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that either Sony or Microsoft will pay a shitload of money to Rockstar to have Red Dead Redemption during their press conference. That, you know, just yeah, I mean, but the like, same like you know, you, if, if you you're Microsoft, that wasn't true? if you're Microsoft, you're like you you want to show off Project Scorpio, and you're like you know, look at the gorgeous 4K gaming, and the game to show off the gorgeous 4K g- gaming is of course Red Dead Redemption. I mean, you know, you steal, you win E3 in that moment if you show off Red Dead Redemption running in 4K on the Scorpio. They come and they hand you the trophy right then. Um, I agree with you, but do you think that w- wasn't true of like a GTA Five? No, I, listen, I, I agree with you, but I'm just saying that I, I'm not basing this on anything. I don't have insider information. I've not read any rumors to this. I'm just saying that I can see a path by which we may see Red Dead there. I don't think that it'll be like a rock star press conference or anything like that, but I could definitely see them. I could definitely see them uh, maybe letting some uh, some of the games slip at one of the console press conferences. I, I would I would love nothing more than that if I, and, uh, and bar none if I had to pick uh, a single game uh, or even if I didn't have to pick a single game but Red Dead Redemption looms far far above the rest to, for my right. desire to see it at E3. Having said that, I mean I, I will say that again, like likelihood is fifty fifty. I think it's equally as likely that Rockstar drops the trailer for that you know like the Friday before E3. Right. You know that should be fine with me. Yeah. I, I mean e- either way either way will work for me. Okay, so uh, ball's back in my court. Uh, Ubisoft. I don't know how the fuck it happened. It's a little bit like becoming a father. Uh, But somewhere along the way, I slipped on a banana peel and stuck my dick in Ubisoft. And now I love their fucking games. (laughs) I I, I think we talked about this with uh, the Division review. It's the same thing for me. Like how the The Division, Wildlands, Steep. Yeah, um, like on and fucking on. So anyway, um, all of which have the same general formula. Yeah, like, go ahead. But th- and that's that's the reason why I play all their fucking games is because I'm like I'm a fan of that. Like you know they're they're all about hey we want to do open world games. I'm like well I like open world games. Hey we like tactical shooters. I'm like I like tactical shooters too. It'd be soft. And then they've got me. You know, um, they're like hey you know we made biscuit and gravy flavored crack cocaine. Brent, I'm like oh, I guess I'm going to be an addict. So so what do you how does that play out at E3 for you this year? So here's what I want to see. I'm very very curious to see what they are going to show off from The Division. Uh Division's been a pretty successful title for them. They've had a good run with it after massive technical difficulties on the PC. I can't speak to the console. Uh the game has finally gotten whipped into shape and they've done some truly 
epic and interesting things with the DLC for the Division. The survival mode, I think, especially is worth checking out. And I am dying to see the what next. And I'm going to go ahead and make a prediction that will likely make me look incredibly foolish later on. But I am not wondering, given the fact that given the fact they've kind of like gone through what they said they'd do as far as the DLC goes, I'm wondering if we don't get the briefest teaser of the Division Two. Because you, you think kn- you know that they're gonna they you know that they're gonna want that money again. Like they got the money for the game, they got the money for the DLC. The DLCs run its course, so they. I mean, their their want of your money has not diminished. So I I I, I do. I think that there's a possibility that they will close. That, that I don't think they'll close the show. Actually, no. Let me back that up. I think that there's a possibility that they will throw in. The briefest teaser trailer might not even be footage, but they'll throw in like the briefest of teaser trailers for the division two coming out in fall 2018. And then of course it'll come out in summer 2020, but anyway, um, thereby not like, so, you know, they, they talked they've been talking about year two of the division, right? Uh, so you think year two is going to, is going to run us up to like fall of 2018 while they're where they will release the division two. I don't know. I, I I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see what what they do with it. I think that, you know, they've got legs. I mean, like I said, what they've done with the DLC right now has convinced me that, you know, they can build off this game for a while. So perhaps, it, you know, maybe it's not a sequel. Maybe it is, you know, just a uh, a really epic, you know, kind of a DLC thing. But um, I, I'm specifically interested to see what they do with The Division, whether it's a sequel, whether it's a... Whether it's a um, a DLC thing. Mostly, I just like on the outside chance that they announce the sequel. I just want to be able to say, "Aha!" <laughs> I see what you're doing here. Yeah. So this is what we're doing. We're just going to name things well, that see, I'm try- could happen. I'm so- trying to be a futurist, and this is what being a futurist is. Being a futurist is saying ludicrous things like a thousand times, and then on the one that you get right, you get a book deal. You get to move into a mansion. They hand you the keys to a really cool car. And then you start dressing like a, um, well, like, okay, maybe the fashion sense doesn't, isn't really all that great, but everything else about being a futurist is awesome. And so, so fair I'm enough, trying then. to get, like, I'm trying to get into that zone, Lauren. I'm trying to get into that industry. So then I want to put down on paper right now yeah. that I believe that Red Dead Redemption 2 is going to be a Marty McFly story where the characters from GTA 5 actually travel back in time to the Old West. And you have just given me a hard on. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so that's interesting, Brent. Uh, you know, you remember that they recently, not recently, but a few months ago, maybe four months ago or so, uh, put out a survey, Ubisoft did, put out a survey about uh, what would you like to see in the next Division story? Would you like to see more New York? Would yeah. you like to see it set in a different city? Um, and so that makes some sense to me. I think I think you could be onto something. I think that could be possible, Brent. I think pers- like what I would like to see in the sequel really is I'd like to see him go to a different city. I'd love to see them do... I like I don't like we I remember we talked about this me and Fatui and Lance and uh, Neil we, we talked about this one day and I can't remember like you know we talked about London we talked about Hong Kong we talked about you know something that would be you know like really really kind of uh you know like off the the beaten path like uh you know Dubai or something like that um but um that's interesting I, you know I feel I don't know if I I'd agree be, because I just think they did New York so well right in the division, and that city is so much uh, a part of that game to me that I would actually like to see more of New York up through Central Park and up into the northern parts of Manhattan and over into Brooklyn. The main thing um, that I want from the game, setting aside, is I, I want to see like another narrative, you know, driven kind of thing. Like I'm, I as much as I love their in-game content, I'm ready to kind of reset the clock a little bit and do like a real narrative driven thing again. I'd like to see. I agree. I, and I would like that. to see even more emphasis on the narrative because what they did, they did so well. And and yeah. that game did, I think from my, in my, in my mind, one of the best jobs of those little things that are throughout the world, like the audio tapes you pick up and yeah. uh, the echoes and stuff like that, I think are better than they, in most games, they were very narratively interesting. And I would like to I see agree. more narrative content. I agree. All right. So uh, the, um, one of the thing I'm just going to do this real briefly is yep. I, I just want to see what they have to say about Ghost Recon Wildlands. Uh, I, I'm very curious to see 
what they might talk about in the way of uh, of upcoming DLC and if they're going to do DLC as creatively and, as they have for the division. Very very interesting. Yeah, it will to be interesting. That. People are, are are pretty displeased so far with the DLC that they have announced that came with the season pass because it went way more on the side of zany than on the side yeah. of tactical. It's real um, it's real Saints Row. Yeah, and so uh, and people were pretty annoyed by that, and they were very vocal about it in both forums and on Reddit, and so yeah. that will be interesting as well. So, all right, um, your turn. So, really, Red Dead Redemption is the only thing on my <laughs> list that I give a shit about. <laughs> Come um, on, got to be something else. Well, hey, I'll uh, give, there I'll are give you some shit from I'll give you some some shit from my list. Uh, no, there are a couple other things I am interested in seeing. All right, um, Destiny Two. Okay, uh, I'm very interested in seeing more from. It's going to come to the PC for the first time. Yeah. Um, which I uh, find intriguing and and might bring me back into the folds of that game. I played Destiny. Right. Um, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't didn't I didn't have the reaction like I did with uh, the Division or Wildlands, where I continued to play after I finished the story. And yeah. Um, and I'm hoping you know some of the guys that I play with are really excited about it uh, coming to the PC and about the prospects. And so I'm hoping hoping that um, that in coming to the PC and uh, in, in the improvements that they will make based on their player base of the original Destiny, that the game will bring me back into the fold. Okay. Um, that is one. I have to say, I'm also interested for the first time in a long, long, long time uh, in Call of Duty. That's interesting. Um, the trailers that have come out... Um, a real return to form them, for that franchise. They are. I mean, they, they feel like that. I'm, I'm ex- To say I'm cautiously optimistic would be profoundly overstating um, the amount of um, Interest trust have. I have in those companies. But the trailer does feel like a return to form and a return to form, but in modern, uh, you, you know, with, with all the trappings of a modern game in terms of the quality of the gameplay and the, and the uh, graphics. And so it might be interesting if, to revisit the early sort of Call of Duty, uh, you know, locale. But in the modern sort of dressing that you know where the franchise has you know has become so tuned and uh, and that you know they they've done so much evolving in terms of their gameplay and their yeah uh, man I mean if they if they are there's something special about World War II there just is I mean we've played these types of games in all sorts of different settings and at least for me there's something special about World War II I don't I can't put my finger on it right. from a narrative standpoint um, and if they if they nail if they actually put some effort into the single player uh, uh, instead of just making it some five-hour throwaway, whatever, just so they can get a multiplayer out there, um, I would be interested in it. Like I said, I am extremely dubious that that will actually be the reality. Um, that the trailer is not just window dressing for the next Call of Duty multiplayer game. That they're, you know, taking what they have and adding fifty more options to it, but it's essentially the same game kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I'm curious. I'm curious enough. Curious enough that when the trailers keep coming up in my YouTube feed. Um, they move me when I watch them. So uh, I'm curious. All right. Yep. Fair enough. Um, next one for me is Bethesda. Bethesda has kind of come out of nowhere to suddenly be a force to be reckoned with at E3. And I am very, very curious to see what they have to say at this year's E3. We know that they're doing a presser again. And I think that many people will agree with me in that the timing is just about right to hear something about a new Elder Scrolls title. So interesting. I am I am going to be watching live with popcorn and a lot of anticipation to see what uh, what Bethesda has to say at the at this year's E3. I that was not even in my consciousness, Brent. And that is a when did Elder Scrolls when did Skyrim come out? Oh my god. <laughs> Let me look it up here. It's been 13? a while. 11. 2011. Yeah. S- 6 years ago at this point. Obviously, you know, Elder Scrolls You could be right. Elder Scrolls and Fallout, you know, there's there's a bit of like an alternating kind of uh, you know, uh, quality to those games. And uh, yeah, Jesus Christ, November eleventh, twenty eleven. I know, isn't that crazy? It is a little bit crazy. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, um, New Elder Scrolls is definitely a possibility. That is interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Okay, okay. Now and see, you're pulling out better stuff than I am. 
that's usually how the show works, though. Um, You're pulling. <laughs> um, so, thank you. I was expecting that. That's what she said. So really, um, you know, just par for the course. So my next game that I would be interested in hearing about, and I'm quite actually confident that I think we will hear about, uh, is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really, really, really enjoyed the last Tomb Raider um, game. Actually, and that, yeah, I still haven't played. I still haven't played Rise of the Tomb Raider yet. I own it, but I haven't played it yet. Oh my God, Brent, you should play it. It's it's fantastic. It's not perfect by any means, yeah. but it's very, very good. And um, I'm really excited for the Shadow of the Tomb Raider. We do not have a release date for that game yet. I would not be the least bit surprised if we got one. Right. Uh, rumors are saying early 2018. I would be uh, thrilled if it was sooner than that, but I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I especially, you know, fall is such a, a difficult window. And if you have something like Red Dead Redemption coming in and, um, but uh, I would like to see more from Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I would like a release date from Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Yeah. And I really, really want to see what they're doing with Lara's hair. Okay. I'm, Yes, why not? <laughs> I can't believe you haven't played that yet, man. I'm so I got I'm jealous of you now that you have that like that you have that out there in front of you. Yeah. to check out. I'm uh, I'm anxiously anticipating um getting back around to it. But you know, that's like I'm so focused on like doing multiplayer stuff these days that you know, yeah. like my my window for doing single player games is even sort of smaller than my window for um uh, for doing multiplayer. All right. Sure. So Okay, what else you got? Next up for me is uh, the occupation this is the follow-up from uh, your friend and mine, Mr. James Burton, and uh, all of the talented, talented people at White Paper Games, who, of course, uh, did Ether One, which uh, Lauren and I were such big fans of. Uh, tremendous, big. tremendous first title. And uh, The Occupation is their new game. Uh, we've seen an announced trailer for it. They've said that it's going to be coming this year. And I think... And I and I don't I, I know nothing. I haven't asked James this. I you know I have enough respect for him to you know not sink to that level of asking him to you know feed me information or something like that. I've not reached out to anybody at White Paper about this. This is pure speculation. But I think I feel like you just did. I think that uh, given how Ether One went and the fact that uh, that game through word of mouth became uh, you know pretty pretty big deal, and certainly that. Um, you know, that we saw, you know, console release and everything. Uh, I think it's a possibility that uh, the occupation might show up in Sony's press conference somewhere. That would make me very, very excited. I would love to see it happen. I would love to see it happen for the game. I'd love to see it happen for them. I don't know if it will, but, uh, you know, Sony usually takes a little time during their press conferences to, uh, to masturbate furiously over indie gaming. And, uh, and I, I like to watch and, uh, and participate. And so, um, I think that if they stay true to form and do a little song and dance number for indie gaming, I would be willing to bet you that the occupation will be part of that song and dance. So at this point, I'm expecting James to reach out to us to confirm that we should have the scoop on that, uh, the world release. What, what was it? What was it? That world exclusive, excuse me, <laughs> <laughs> that game trailers used to do for, um, for all for all the good it will do us. We should have a world exclusive interview on this game before <laughs> Sony, uh, the Sony presser. Uh, no, that would be fantastic. The trailer for that game looks outstanding. As you said, Ether One was fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. Man. Um, like God, you're you're really you're you're pulling out some good stuff. Maybe, uh, maybe wishful thinking. Maybe wishful thinking. So, but so uh, here's my second, my real second pie in the sky next to uh, Red Dead Redemption. Yeah. Do you have any idea what I'm going to say? No, but, uh, but Cyberpunk it's also 2077. Because I don't care, but keep. <laughs> but go ahead. What are you going to say? <laughs> Cyberpunk 2077. That's my next one too. That's great. <laughs> hey, cool. Uh, now I I don't I, I don't think it's going to be there. Oh, I think it is. Um, I think it totally. Do you is. think so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, CD Projekt Red will show up at the PC gaming show, and they'll show off uh, something for Cyberpunk 2077. The game's supposed that, to be out in 2019, so it's two years away. It's the perfect time. To sh you know, to show a teaser or some alpha gameplay or something like that. I think that I think it's totally plausible. Now, I mean, uh, it ain't going to happen, but it's totally pl plausible. plausible versus likely. Is two, yeah, uh, two I, different I, things. I don't, obviously, I don't know how likely it is, but I think it, I think it's two years away. Yeah, they could do it. They could do it. I think they're too busy trying trying to backpedal the fact that they they screwed up and put Gwent on the PC instead of on the a mobile platform. 
Yeah, that uh, that that was a just their whole response to Gwent. They're like for a company that does so many things right. I'm still scratching my head over how they didn't handle the Gwent phenomenon better. I, I feel like they really, really missed the mark on that. They did huge. They went. I mean, the, they took them too long to pivot and actually start doing it. Yeah. And and then to, when they did to make the decision to to not make it a mobile game, terrible. But to make it terrible it, idea. It was, yeah. It was, <laughs> I don't know why they did that. I mean, as much as I love to sit and play Gwen on my computer, yeah. it is the absolute, or or on my console even, maybe, it is the absolute perfect game for, a, yeah. for, an, for, phone, for a mobile for tablet. platform. Uh, I, I yeah. agree. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is one that we share. I don't know if it's going to be on both of our lists at this slot, but uh, and we've already kind of talked about it a little bit, but that's uh, Detroit Become Human, the next yep. game from Quantic Dream. We've already seen uh, a little bit of this game. Yep. Was that was that last year's E3? Yeah. Um, so I am ready to see a bit more. I'm ready to see some uh, some gameplay demo, perhaps. I'm ready to get some more information. Uh, you and I are a little bit of a minority on our interest in David Cage and Quantic Dream and the titles yeah. they've done. Uh, controversial, they they are. But. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm sort of unapologetically a fan, and uh, I'm very very anxious to see what Detroit Become Human actually shapes up to be as far as a game. And I can already hear people saying, "Well, let me tell you, it's not going to be a game for starters." Um, <laughs> but, you know, those games like with all the walking simulators, like Ethan Carter and that kind of stuff coming out. Yeah, you know, Cage's games make those games look like arcade games. I mean, you know, David David Cage's games looks like arcade games compared to those. There's actual gameplay, unlike these walking simulators. I agree. I don't know. I'm actually surprised at how much we tend to be in the minority uh, in the outlaw gamers community. Yeah. Uh, I would think in our community that there would there would be more fans, um, um, but there's not. And I know that, and that's fine, and I accept it. That doesn't mean there aren't any. But uh, I, I think David Cage does really interesting stuff, and his games are far from perfect, but they're also very unique, and some of them are extremely... Um, they, they leverage the medium in ways that other games just don't. They do. Um, and I think they're fascinating. And so I'm super excited that Detroit Become Human is high on my list. Yeah. All right. Um, wh- uh, I still got a couple more. Yeah, I've got one more, so go ahead and go. All right. So uh, I, I'm gonna, I think I know what your, your next one is going to be, yeah. so I, I'm going to try and stay away from it. But um, uh, Days Gone is something I'm interested in. Okay. Uh, that is the, the new zombie game from uh that's going to come uh, exclusively to ps4 or, or to the playstation um from ben studio um we don't have a release date for that game yet it's supposed to be in 2017 i, I think we'll probably get a release date for it um the the media we have seen so far uh has been interesting to me and so uh, i am looking forward to seeing more on days gone it's, it's not something that i'm eagerly anticipating that's a, a la red dead redemption or cyberpunk 2077 um, or even Detroit become human, but I am I am very interested to see uh, more from that and, tr- and learn more about the gameplay. Really, is what I'm I'm particularly interested in. Right. All right. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to go with one that is almost a definite, and then I'll finish with one that is you know, as outlandish as some of the predictions I've made have been. This will be this will really be the one that plants the javelin downfield. Um, so here's the, here's the one I think is very likely, uh, death stranding. I say likely it's a certainty that we're going to see death stranding yes. at E3. I'm very anxious to see whatever they have to show of death stranding at E3. As am I, that's pretty high on my list too. Uh, Hideo Kojima, obviously, um, very, very interested that, you know, what we've seen so far is so fucking weird and, and obtuse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm curious. I'm not, I, I'm not knows? thinking that's going to change. Like, yeah, right. I, I, we I, see, say, I don't think I'm going to understand it anymore. Like, it's not going to make <laughs> I, any more sense, but I'll still yeah. be there to see it. Yes. I, I'm very, I'm also interested. So that is not actually the game I thought you were going to say though. Okay. Um, because I thought pretty high on your list would be to see, uh, more about Spider-Man. You know, that's actually a good point. I, I don't really have that on here, but I guess that, <laughs> you know, in a way, like, I, I don't really care because I'm just going to like buy the game. Um, Oh, I thought I actually thought you were going to say you you're, you don't really care because 
you're coming into it with such low expectations. No, I think it's going to be great. I, I I have total faith that it's it's going to be awesome. Like I guess I'm already kind of sold on it in a way. That's that's that's. But yeah, th- that, that's a good point. That's one that I should have uh, I should have had as well. So um, before you make your outlandish yes. um, uh, predictions, Brent, there are a couple other games that I just want to throw out there because I think people will, will care about them. The Last of Us 2. Right. Yo, that's, um, yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. I think we're going to see uh, content from... I don't care about it, but I yeah. think most the rest of the universe does. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't care about this, but uh, and that is the, the first story DLC from Naughty Dog for Uncharted, Uncharted for The Lost Legacy. Um, I think a, a lot of people will care, and we're going to see more about that. I, 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 I'm not interested in I'm it because totally I don't down. like. You are or are not? I am. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm eager. Yeah, so I, I, I don't like the direction they went with the DLC um, in terms of the characters they chose to focus on. I really, really think they missed an opportunity here by either focusing on uh, Nate and Elena's daughter, which I think would have been the best thing it, to do. Give it time. Give it time. Um, ain't, they ain't done with it well, yet. You mean with different DLC? Yeah, I, I could. I, I mean, I'd like to see that too. But I mean, just because they're not doing it first out of the gate doesn't mean it's not happening. No, but in terms of this DLC, I think that would have been much more interesting. I also think more interesting would have been to do DLC that was centered entirely around Nate and Sam as as uh, children. I loved those that that aspects of the game, and I think it could have been uh, particularly interesting. I can see that. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. Maybe something will convince me when I see it. But we'll be seeing more of that. I'm sure. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. So those there, those are a couple games um, that I think people are going to care about. That's certainly not everything. I mean, obviously, oh sure, um, yeah, it's going to be. You nice know what's stuff. coming with Project Scorpio? What's what Nintendo Switch has coming? PlayStation VR. Um, I want to see everything. VR is to supposed to be that. huge for PlayStation. Yeah. Uh, Oculus. You know, there's definitely some questions. Of where's the VR industry at now? Right. Content is really becoming important. Uh, so the, and that's supposed to be especially for PlayStation. I've heard that. That uh, VR is is going to be a, a big focus for them. Yeah, I want to see uh, what PlayStation VR ha- or what place what Sony has to show off with PlayStation VR during their presser. I think they're going to make a major push there. I'm very very eager to see Microsoft showing some games running on Scorpio and really kind of see what all that hardware equates to in terms of the experience. Yep, I'm curious to see if Nintendo uh, manages to uh, you know to get get people's attention in a, an even bigger way. Um, all right, so here it and is. And then, of course, there's the games that we're not even thinking of that are going to be com- oh, yeah. complete surprises. I did forget sure. one more, Brent. Go ahead. That I'm very, very interested in seeing is God of War. Yes, that's that's a that's another great one. That's another one I should have had on my list as well. That was one definitely. of the most compelling pieces of media uh, for me in 2016. Yeah. And uh, definitely. Uh, so God I'm really excited to see more of that, and maybe maybe even get a release date would be amazing. We'll see. Um, all right, so here's the one. This is my real Hail Mary pass here with this last game. But um, I want to see Borderlands 3. Oh. At E3. That's what, I, that's what I want. Interesting. I think the timing is just about right. I don't, I, like, I, I don't pay it, uh, that much attention to, uh, you know, to like Randy Pitchford in the news these days. I think he's probably... Uh, gotten smart and hasn't been putting himself out into the news these days as much as he used to, uh, especially since uh, Colonial Marines. But I think that uh, <laughs> I think that Gearbox still bitter could yes, I am. I think Gearbox could earn their way back into my heart and many other people's hearts if they were to drop something, some kind of first media, some kind of first look on Borderlands three. I don't even know if they've announced that they're working on it, but. That's something I'd li- I'd like to see. I'd like to see Borderlands three. That that uh, I I would like to see that as well. I would like to see that as well. So that's it. That's what I got, man. All right, all right. I like it. I like it. So that's E three. It's obviously it's a little bit early right now. It's early May. the The show is uh, June eleventh, twelfth, something like that. Yeah. Um, and so uh, my guess is, as we get closer to it, we'll hear some more about it. I don't know. If we have are planning on doing a show prior to E3, but hopefully we will be doing at least a show around E3, yeah. if not a couple, or I don't, you know, whatever we end up doing, we'll do E3 coverage um, of some sort. We will indeed, and uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. You know, I got to be honest, Brent. I wasn't in prepping for it, and I kind of looked through, and I said, "Yeah, that looks interesting. That looks interesting." I wasn't as excited as now that we're actually talking through it. Um, there's, there's, there are quite a few uh, big 
g- g- games that are big for me. Yeah. Interesting games: God of War, uh, Red Dead Redemption, potentially uh, Detroit Become Human, Death Stranding. Yeah. I mean, there's there's quite a few games um, that I'm excited to see about. Between the things that we know will be there and the things that we are feeling are likely to be there, this could be a pretty big year for the show. I, I think this could be one of the bigger years in quite some time, actually. Yeah. So, having said right. that, let's move on to our third and final section, and we're going to talk about what we've been playing. Yes. Um, what we have been playing, literally, you and I have been playing, is uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands. We won't put you through a postmortem. An entire postmortem. <laughs> a third section, 90-minute postmortem. Uh, we won't do that to you, but uh, we are going to talk about this game a little bit, because it bears mentioning it, this game is worth talking about uh because for all of the things that it it kind of fails on it uh it soars in in other areas and what i will say is that to me the game represents a a decent first effort but more so a really really exciting direction for them to pursue in DLC and future titles. Because what I desperately want is to see a more polished and more complex, more rich Ghost Recon Wildlands experience after after having played the first game to completion. So, uh, so f- to start out the discussion, let's just say that... Uh, I- we both played the game. Brent, you have completed the story. I've completed the story. Um, 100%. How many hours? Do you know how many hours you put into the game overall? Mm, it's a little over 100, I want to say. Okay, I put around 75 hours into the game, and I'm about 25% done with the story. Okay. Uh, just to just to give context. Um, not that that's necessarily relevant. We'll talk about that. Um, uh, certainly not to the conversation. So I'm curious to, to know. So I agree with you. It's interesting. You put a hundred hours into it, and you think of it, and and, and I'm assuming ninety nine percent of those hours have been uh, fun for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, dis- despite that, and this is where I think Ubisoft has has really, at least again for me, nailed it in the last year or so. For me, with Steep and the Division, and this is all of these games have a, not not just some faults, but a significant number of faults. Yes, both technical. <laughs> In terms of narrative design, uh, in terms of gameplay design and mechanics, in, in terms of just basic um, functionality, I mean, these games are broken to one degree or another. They, they, which are not Wildlands so much. Uh, Wild- not, at, not, not nearly. Wildlands what? is pretty bad, but not nearly to the degree that the division was. Think, is it? I think if you were playing with people uh, as spread out, you know, you have to remember that, you know, so like I'm, I'm playing from North America. Neil's in the UK. Fett's in Denmark, Lance's in Japan. So we really sort of push what Ghost Recon Wildlands could do in terms of server synchronization. We push that to its limits. And I mean, it, it's fun. I mean, like it, they the bugs actually make the game fun to a degree because, you know, I'm flying a helicopter. The other three guys are on board. I'm like, okay, so we're going to go here. And then the mission objective is this. And they're just laughing their asses off. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And they start posting screenshots to Discord of me running around on top of the helicopter blades. You know, be- because, <laughs> the, or, you know, or, you know, like we're in a boat, we're going somewhere. And I'm, you know, I'm 30 feet behind them running across the water as if I'm water skiing. That's awesome. So I actually am jealous of that. Because so, I've had... I've had almost none of those issues. I play almost exclusively with North American yeah. uh, um, partners for most of the game, you and Aaron. Um, and we've had virtually none, not none, but virtually no issues like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, and frankly, I'm a little jealous. I want to see the water skiing. That, but, that's the thing. I mean, um, some of the bugs were actually like make the game more fun. But at the same time, <laughs> there's also those days where you log in and like the helicopter the helicopter blades aren't spinning. Like it's just a stationary model that's just kind of flying around with no sound effects. Right. It breaks the immersion and, and it feels. And you can't see anybody else. You're like, are you guys in the helicopter? Like, yes, we're in the helicopter. Get the fucking shot. Like, I can't see you. Like the helicopter looks empty. It's flying itself. And like, everybody's like, okay, quit out. And you know, we'll try again. And yeah, right. That kind of yeah. Thing. So, so I mean, all of these games have issues. And again, not just technical issues, but like, Gameplay design choices and narrative issues oh, yeah. and blah, 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 blah. But 
Um, they have managed to strike a formula, at least in my experience, and I, I believe yours too, Brent, that despite all of that, the games ninety for ninety nine percent of the time are, are fun. Yeah. I, and they're fun to play. And there's something about their core mechanics and the world setting up. And so, you know, Ubisoft made a decision, I think it was a couple of years ago at this point. Yeah. That we all scoffed at, open world uh, where games. they said, open world games. screw it, we're only doing open world games from now on. We're not doing anything else. And we thought, that is, it, that's, A, you're idea. not that great at them. <laughs> you're not even that great at them. And, <laughs> exactly. and B, like you're cutting off a huge section of your market. Uh, and so I really consider them still in the learning phase of this. And I, yeah. I'm willing to give them you know, five years to like release these games and, and get feedback from the consumers. I have to give them a tremendous amount of credit. I have played uh, uh, a lot of hours in the division and a lot of hours in ghost recon wildlands and have been very active on Reddit in both games. Yeah. And th they are extremely active in their community and reaching out and asking for feedback on a regular basis yeah. uh, and making changes from that feedback. I and so I really saw that in the division. Yep. Uh, and, and and it's very similar in Wildlands, um, uh, and so um, so so something about the Ubisoft's games in the last couple of years have really been hitting a, a sweet spot with me. So that being said, um, uh, I I, th I, th I think Wildlands is a tremendous amount of fun. Um, yes. Again, there were there were design choices that left a lot uh, that left a lot to be desired. I particularly. Um, and they've responded already by patching some of this in. I, uh, HUD customization, I think, is a big, big deal in this game mm -hmm. because it's really how you control. So so for those of you that have played Ghost Recon before, Ghost Recon started off as, as a very um, tactical game yeah. uh, where you would play with, uh, uh, you know, anywhere from one to three friends and you would, it, you would, it was the whole mission structure was extremely tactical. Um, a lot of people feel like, and it's uh, not untrue, that Wildlands has uh, veered away from the tactical nature of the Ghost Recon series and gotten more to um, uh, more arcadey gameplay. Uh, you, could, you know, the open world. You can help fix that by cranking the difficulty to extreme. Extreme makes it a lot more tactical. Well, so I uh, the entire time we've played this game, Brent, we have cr we cranked the difficulty to extreme and removed eighty five percent or more of the HUD. Right. Um, so you weren't doing things like seeing um, 3D markers in the real world of care of uh, enemies that would follow them as they walk through buildings. So you always knew where everybody was. Right, right. Uh, that kind of stuff. We made that choice thanks to a, a wonderful Reddit post that suggested doing that. And and really, the HUD customization fundamentally changes the nature of how you play that game uh, mm -hmm. in terms of tacticality. Yeah. Because when you know where everybody is in a base, uh, where every enemy is it doesn't require you to be overly careful because you can see where everyone is and, and they give you the tools to do that. I wish they had done a better job of laying that out um, and, and really actually created like HUD presets right. for people to sort of one click and say, if you want to play really tactically, choose tactical and your 3D spotting and your mini map markers uh, won't, uh, won't work, and, but your sync shot will. If you like to play more run and gun and arcadey, you know, choose this, and then here's a somewhere in between. Right. Um, yeah, it was a, really only be that's a cool idea. Go ahead. That's a cool idea. Yeah, it's really only because I was in Reddit reading that stuff ahead of time that I knew to do that, and I did it as soon as I started the game. There was a point. Uh, so Aaron and I, uh, and I think you know this, Brent, but we not only did we get rid of eighty five percent of the HUD, but we also play where you cannot refill your ammo in the wild. So you can only refill ammo at uh, at safe houses. Yeah, you know, um, I, I wanted to tell you, you know, because I played with you guys several times, and I wanted to tell you that I thought about that, and I decided that it was bullshit. And here, here is the here is the the, the support uh, to that argument. I think yes. that you should allow yourself to um, to refill at enemy ammo stations, and the reason is because. 99% of the weapons in the game you are procuring in the wild from enemy forces, and it stands to reason they would have ammunition for those weapons at their bases. Well, so here's what I would say to that to push back a little is if you're trying to be realistic. So in the game, you can pick up ammo by walking over guys, yeah. right? So you can continue to refill your ammo by taking it off of other guys, which I feel like is realistic. And then if maybe maybe the medium would be as if you um, re-ammoed up at, those, at the munitions, like where they actually keep munitions. Yeah, like in the armories. But I, right, exactly. But I find it hard to believe that every place you go, there would be five 
like just crates filled with ammo just sitting everywhere. Now, like I respect what you're doing. Like like I respect that you know you're 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 trying to kind of create an almost role playing type experience where you're really kind of saying like like what would the realistic you know aspect of this situation what would it be? And, well, and, actually, and I, I hold on, let me stop that. you for a second. We're not actually I don't we a little bit, but I really think what we're trying to do is is get it get back to the original tacticality mm-hmm. of some of the early games, and we just felt like the. The um, the ammo crates were there were too many of them in the wild, right. so right. well, like it, it, maybe if it was just armories that would make more sense. But they're just they're everywhere. They're just littered everywhere. Maybe maybe like like the the armory would be kind of a good medium to strike where you're. And I'll uh, you know what Brent I'll tell you that that honestly so we've played the entire game I've eighty plus hours, um where we've been playing like that and not refilling ammo in the wild yeah. and never once have I had a problem. Well, no, ever I I agree with you, but the thing is like I, I actually really like the way you guys play. Um, I, I, there's days that I don't think I'd have the patience for it. And that's just because like, like the way that we play is a little bit, we're a little bit faster paced and w- our focus is, is a little bit more on fun, you know? Um, because, <laughs> because it kind of has to be, it kind of has well, to be in minute, a way. Wait a minute. Just to be clear, our, the way we play is fun. No, 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 I, I, it's I a mean, different kind of fun. Okay, we play with the soundboard where we've got, you know, right of the Valkyries, <laughs> you know, pumping out of the chopper. So that is the greatest thing I've ever seen in video games. So I want to explain this to people. Right. So what Brent has done is created a soundboard on his computer. And every time they get into a helicopter, it's not, this isn't the only time, but they get into a helicopter and Brent puts on music like. Uh, Ride of the Valkyries, or Magnum P- or the Magnum now, PI or, theme, or the Magnum PI, or the it's Airwolf just, it's theme, fucking brilliant. Or it could be Mars Bringer of War, or it could be Long Tall Sally, you know, from like Predator. It could be. You the also Predator do it theme. like when you when you complete missions and oh, stuff, yeah, right? Like I've got like a whole list of stingers, like you know, we are the champions. You're the best from the Karate Kid. You got the touch by Stan Bush. Um, I've got a whole bunch of stingers for like every time we get a mission completed, anytime we get in a car. You know, it's going to be like the Knight Rider theme or Starsky and Hutch or Convoy. If we've got more than one car, if we get into a, a boat, it's Miami Vice. You know, if we get into a plane, it's Danger Zone from Top Gun. It and, seriously and on, is on, one on, of the on. most brilliant things I've ever seen anybody do you, with a video game. You cannot imagine. You cannot imagine. Have you posted a YouTube video about this? Uh, I've, well, I've tried to, but as you imagine, as you can imagine, YouTube's content ID system loves to uh, it rain fucking wrath down upon my Ghost Recon vids. Oh yeah, I bet. But anyway, uh, so you're no, no, and I understand what you're saying. So we, so but let me. We so, were playing with a little bit more of a casual sort of yeah, it's a different. So, but but what I'm saying is. And so some of the other things we do is like we won't change loadouts out in the wild. Right. We only like if we if we leave the safe house with a certain sniper rifle and a certain assault you're rifle, stick with that. you have to play with that because you, you know, again, in the real house. world, you're not going to just cycle through all your weapons yeah. out in the jungle. I totally get that. Um, That's cool. And so doing those things has made the game. Uh, it's just a, it is a hugely fundamentally different experience after playing that way for about 10 or 15 hours. Yeah. We started. So we what, what Aaron and I did was we said, OK. Uh, we t- there's four branches I think right production and security and something else and something else yeah um, we said smuggling. security security uh, smuggling so, so we said security um, missions we'll we'll do alone because we're not always going to be able to play together and we'll save the other three branches for co-op play okay. and so um, you know a few a, a week into it or whatever I was playing on my own and I went in and I and I was just hunting weapons at that point I was like I want to go get the best sniper rifle yeah. I want to get the blah 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 so I'm just going to turn on the markers and all the HUD and everything. Because I don't want to screw around with this. I don't want to take four hours to infiltrate. I just want to be able to go in and blah, blah, blah. Right. And it totally changes the way you play the game. It changes the game into like a loot shooter um, uh, in, in, in an action loot shooter, yeah. right? With with almost no recon necessary. And um, after a very short time, I grew bored with playing the game that way. And I thought to myself, like 80% or more or 90% of the players playing this game are playing it this way. Because that's the default uh, way that the game comes, mm-hmm. um, and it's it literally is like a whole different game. And so, um, anyway, so that's how we're playing the game. And and uh, Wildlands has a lot of issues. The the narrative is um, <laughs> bland. It, it, whereas well, where the division, I thought the narrative was fantastic. Yes, let, let, let's let's say what needs to be said here. This is the worst written game I have played in fifteen years or more. It is fucking awful. Who, whoever whoever wrote this game, I pray to God that you look back on it as a learning experience because it sure as fuck wasn't worth anything else. Like the, the fucking incidental dialogue in this game 
it, that is awful. It is, it is amazing how bad it is. I mean, it's fucking amazing how awful some of the dialogue in this game is. It's true. It's off. It's terrible. Unlike the division, which I thought was fantastic yes. uh, dialogue, not only acting dialogue yes. in their story. This is this is terrible. This ain't that. Um, Those people did but not on work the on other this hand, fucking game. On the other hand, um, it is one of the most beautiful game worlds I've ever played it's in. It's terrific. It is stunningly huge. It, it is. I mean, um, it's every inch as big as they say it is. But, um, but... That's what she said. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, I, I will say, I'll, the, the thing about the game world that I... I'm not saying that this is a negative, but there's room for improvement. If they could have the game world the size that it is now... But if it could be as dense and as rich in terms of what you can see and do within the game world as, say, something like a GTA V, I mean, it would be like a landmark, industry-defining kind of title at that point. You know what I mean? Uh, the the only yeah, I, the only issue that I have with the mm. world is that it it feels a bit repetitive. It feels just a, like a little bit thin. And like you see a lot of the same things over and over in just sort of different settings. Well, so wait, I want to, I want to, I want to uh, chew on that for a second because repetitive and empty um, are a little bit are different. And and I do think no, that it, it, empty is not what I mean. I just I mean it's thin. I, I mean it's thin. Like like right. You go, okay, so so you go into a village and you kind of know instantly what you're going to expect to see there. You, you, you like, I mean, all the, like you look at the village and you can tell like, okay, that section over there is all civilians. And then over there where I see the red brick, red brick buildings, that's where the bad guys are going to be because they use the yeah, same so buildings over and over and over throughout the whole Right. Game. Their level design in there. So there's, so a couple of things, it's fucking huge. The, unlike GTA, uh, the game, the entire game world is open from the, the almost the second you step into the game yeah. for the most yeah. part. Um, so for the very beginning of the game, like within 30 minutes, you can go anywhere in the world. You can get in a helicopter and you can go get the best weapon in the game in the most difficult area. The areas, there's 21 areas, provinces, they're divided up by difficulty. Um, Which I really like, go into the, the way. I really like the way they did I, that. I did too. And But you could go, and I did, you can go into the, the most difficult areas in the beginning. And if you're stealthy enough and you play mm -hmm. thoughtfully enough, you could get to the best weapon in the game yeah. within the first hour. Um, which is which is a whole, and we're not going to do a whole post mortem, but I totally could. It's a, it, it has an effect on the game to be able to get the two best weapons in the game within the first hour because it has completely removed all of the meaning of the rest of the weapons for me because I don't give a shit because I have the two best weapons in the game. So um, I really enjoyed and, and so kind of playing through. Like I would just for like an hour, I would just play with you know, like I'd go through all the assault a shotgun rifles. or it's like yeah yeah right. Like I'll, yeah. I'll try the shotgun for the next hour and just like. Just to sort of see how it changed, like how I had to change my play style to sort yeah, of yeah, I've done that a little bit after stuff. I got far enough into the game where I like was interested enough to just change my play style to see how it felt. Yeah, um, but and I agree with you, Brent. So I don't think the world is 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 too sparsely populated. It's set in Bolivia and it feels um, fairly representative, and it's it's absolutely gorgeous. It it, it feels um, I, I like the amount of flying or driving you have to do like yeah, i don't i, I rarely it happens occasionally but it rarely oh that's the other thing we don't do in the world is we don't fast travel uh during real play sessions um but you can fast travel so if you're just trying to hunt weapon parts or something you can, you can, can fast travel and it works pretty well the loading's pretty quick yeah. um uh so i don't feel like I, oh you know the, the flying is so beautiful in the helicopter and it's and it's fun and blah 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 and the driving is fun enough for me that i don't get annoyed when i have to do it um but I agree with you, Brent. When, when you arrive at your destination, um, it's th there's there's maybe five or ten total configurations in all of the whole. You know, okay. you might find a mine here or there. They just keep recycling. Uh, I, I remember one time I found a cave that had water in it, and I just about jumped out of my chair because there was something new. Dude, that that is like one of the coolest things. That, like like it, it's like like a fucking cobra base from GI Joe. It's so fucking cool <laughs> to discover is. that for the first time. Um, but I agree uh, that I would I, I would have liked for there to have been more uh, uniqueness to the different yeah. like urban areas and, that and you're that, going to. That's just to. time. That that's just you know, that's one of those things where you need another six months in development to just do that. You know. Yeah, but um, so so uh, uh the, the game definitely has issues, but the but the the core gameplay. So not only is it one of the most beautiful worlds I've ever played in, and not only is it yeah. probably the biggest I've ever played I in. Agree. Um, but, but the core gameplay, the sniping, the shooting, 
the uh, the drone, um, the the I, we play very stealthy, so the the feeling of moving through a, a camp, the the uh, the time to kill and all that with the bot, like the core gameplay, I feel like is just really in a sweet spot and it's just fun. I mean, Other I can than the driving, snipe. I agree with you. Uh, yeah, and the driving. So a lot of people are down on the driving uh, and the flying. I, I had to read Reddit to learn how to fly the helicopter. The flying is fine. The the, the driving is yeah. spongy as all fucking get out. It is. It is. There's no question that neither one of them are perfect. I really like the. Uh, I try and take the motorcycle as much as I can, yeah. um, because I think that's the most fun thing to drive. But I almost mostly I just fly because I love flying in the game. Yeah, it, it's um, tremendously fun. It is. Uh, Brent, have you come across the airplane? That looks like uh, it's out of Indiana Jones. Yeah, yeah. That that's my favorite vehicle in the game. I don't know if you've done this, but you can barrel roll that thing <laughs> yeah. very easily. It's 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 a lot. It's super responsive. Well, let me tell you, you throw you fly anything through Media Luna, and you will be barrel rolling your ass off. <laughs> that's a true story. <laughs> they got uh, some for those sand sites up there, son. <laughs> so for those of you that are interested, uh, you can go look at my Steam profile, Huckleberry eight eight zero. I think is what it is. Um, I've got 450 pictures of this game. It is the most photographed game I've played. I've got, um, I've got probably uh, 100 hours of video sitting on my hard drive that you know I may or may not Jesus. be able to fucking upload to YouTube. Uh, but yeah. I mean, almost every play session we have of this game, I've got recorded. And man, I'm telling you, we had some good fucking times with this yeah, game. It is a lot of fun. And, and again, so the, so the other piece of it that makes it so brilliant and so delicious is the drop-in, drop-out co-op. Yeah, it's tremendously which, good. Which, and it works well, perfectly. I mean, there's not... That's it. There's like there, that is what makes this game an excellent experience. Is what you just said. I actually really enjoy this game on my own as well. I really do. I played. I've played probably thirty plus forty hours on my own and t- and absolutely loved it. I, but I, I think you're. I mean, I agree. I think I've got forty four hours solo, and then you know whatever, like sixty eight or sixty seven or something like that in co op. Yeah, but this, but drop. I mean, this is what made Borderlands. Was it the first Borderlands this way, or was it? It was. I get both, I, right? I don't One know. and two. Yeah, I can't remember. Was was that same like seamless drop in, drop out co op yeah. where you can? It's just seamless, and you can keep playing on your own or not, or yeah. and it, and not that there's not a couple technical hiccups here and there, but essentially it works perfectly, um, and it's just it's incredibly fun. You you get on. I say, hey Brent, you want to play? Yeah, sure. Whose game you want to play? And let's play in yours. Okay, yeah. and we play, and then when you get out, I just keep playing. Nothing, right. you know. Right. It doesn't matter, uh, and the game keeps perfect track of what missions we've done or not done, or you know. Um, it's, it's just, it's, tr- it's just tremendous fun. I think the, the real, the real sort of get for this game and me was the drop in, drop out co-op. The, the idea of playing this entire game from start to finish with my three friends was incredibly exciting. And the game absolutely delivered on that experience. There's, you know, it's got shortcomings. It's, it's got things that, you know, that need polish and, and all that. But every bit of that, for me personally, pales in comparison to the amount of fun I had playing this game with Neil Fett and Lance. And I'm just desperate to have DLC other than the DLC that's out right now. More, I, I just want more of this game to play, and I, I hope that the, you know, that the DLC release schedule is going to sort of facilitate that. And I'm very kind of curious to see if they do some more unique style things, like the survival DLC from the Division, as an example. They set up an interesting sort of narrative uh, towards uh, towards the end of the game. I won't reveal what it is, but something kind of happens, like in the in the last you know beat of the story, as things are starting to kind of wrap up. They do this interesting narrative thing, and you're like, oh wow, like so. If you were to keep playing, like that would change this and this, and it would make the experience very different and i think about how they could exploit that like in a dlc release that had some narrative aspect to it a lot of possibilities for this title i i i want that's really interesting man i uh, yeah i'll be curious to talk with you about it once you get there yeah when i play it i would love to see them uh take the team to like you know brazil and do some cqc stuff in in a favela or Um, you know, head head to a to cocoa plantation in Vietnam, or you know what I mean. Like that can be some interesting, okay, uh, interesting stuff. But um, all right. So uh, unless you got anything else, Brent, I think we should move on because we still have a few more games to talk about. No, uh, all I'm saying is Ghost Recon Wildlands. Uh, the story sucks, but give it a chance anyway. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I guess we could have said that uh, instead right. of all that we did say. <laughs> um, uh, Brent, next up is uh, a game that I've seen a few of the uh, outlaws posting about. I haven't played it. Hell Divers, dude, play it. 
play it. It's fantastic. What is it? I don't. Even, I don't even really know what it is. What kind of game it's, is it? It's an ice. So it's a. Uh, it's a four player co op. Uh, drop in, drop out. Top down isometric. Shoot and looter, ish. It's like Torchlight Two. Diablo. It's like Torchlight Two meets Contra. So, or another way of saying it is, it's Starship Troopers the game. So ba- huh. basically, you are playing for, you know, like whatever, like like you know, the Grand Imperial Army of Super Earth in some distant future, and so you know, you're like this very stormtrooper esque looking kind of uh, badass, and <laughs> your <laughs> your goal is there, there's all of these like uh you know Verhoeven esque propaganda pieces playing throughout you know spread manage democracy throughout the galaxy protect freedom by conquering star systems and, you know that kind of <laughs> stuff and so the so like this is what a gameplay session goes like you select uh, a planet. Uh, you and your three friends, you crawl into these uh, these pods. They fire the pods down from starships uh, that are in orbit down to the planet's surface. You crawl into your pods. You've got mission objectives to accomplish. Uh, you might have to go and secure a, a a location, you know, like a control point kind of thing. You might have to go and activate a SAM site. Uh, you might have to sweep a minefield. But anyway, you've got mission objectives that you're supposed to accomplish. There's resources you can gather. And if you gather enough resources, that'll kind of get turned into, you know, like a point that you can then use to unlock weapon upgrades, as an example. Um, you've got a variety of weapons and things you can use. A big, big chunk of the game is what they call stratagems, which are these different types of equipment that you can call down from the ship, and they'll, you know, fire them down from orbit to your location. It could be like a light machine gun. It could be an Actually, like you know what, Brent? I, I, so as you're describing this, I pulled it up, and I think I did play this. Dude. It's fucking fantastic. I mean, you, but I played it on my own. Yeah, I mean, way way better with friends. Way better with friends. I mean, it's just a laugh fucking riot as you're mowing down like, you know, these endless waves of, you know, enemies and everything while shouting things like, "How about a nice cup of liberty?" And uh, <laughs> you know, like you're chucking a grenade like, "Have some freedom." It's got all this really terrific and subversive kind of tongue-in-cheek humor built on top of one of the most solid like loot and shoot game mechanics I've ever played. It is so compellingly fun to just play the game. In addition to the fact it has this really, really fun kind of narrative premise, fantastic, fantastic game. Can't recommend it enough. I know it's on, uh, I don't know if it's on Xbox or not. I know that it's on uh, Vita PS4. I want to say, um, and then, and then obviously we're playing on PC. It may very well be on uh, Xbox as well. I don't know. But uh, fantastic title if you can pick it up anywhere and if you can play with some friends, do it. Awesome. All right. Um, so w- my next game, Brent, we've each got a few games uh, this week, one of which is Tom Clancy, of course. But uh, Mafia 3, I picked up Mafia 3 on sale off of Green Man Gaming for 16 bucks. Oh, what a, what, a, what a good deal. How is it? That was 16 bucks, by the way, I think, with the season pass. That's a um, pretty good price. So it's interesting, you know. There was a lot of ne- I've I've put about seven hours into the game so far. I've, I've been playing three games at it right now concurrently, and so so I've I've kind of gone back and forth. I've played about seven hours of the game fo- so far. It got a lot of negative press yeah. uh, when it came out. A lot of talk about repetition, um, which I see, but but it really feels like a mafia game. Uh, in that, uh, I thought Mafia Two wasn't really that great of a game. It was just a, a, a really fascinating world. If you remember, Mafia 2 is just so well realized as a world that it was compelling to be in, yeah. but the gameplay mechanics weren't groundbreaking, and the world was very sparse with content. You could go anywhere, um, but unlike in like the GTAs and the games that it was being compared to, there was really nothing to do when you went anywhere outside of the story missions. Yeah. Um, Mafia 3 is very much the same way. Um, you, there's not a whole lot to do so far outside of the story missions. The missions are repetitive, um, but the writing and acting and world building is top notch. Uh, and I, I, you know, I don't know that I've ever played a game set in the late 1960s in the United States. Uh, I think I feel like all the games that I've played in the late 60s were set in Vietnam itself. Right. But this is set <clears> in the United <throat> States, and they, they it says right at the beginning of the game when you load it up, just so you know. Um, 
the dialogue in this game does not reflect the belief of the creators, but we felt like it would be inappropriate to leave the racism of the time out of the game. Yeah. So be warned that it's there. And so it's there. And it's not just there like you hear people say shit like, get out of here, nigger, which you do, which is uncomfortable. Mm. Um, but like in the opening mission, um, you play as Lincoln Clay, who's a black character. He's an African-American character. He's actually mixed race, um, I think. And um, uh, uh, he's going to do a heist with a white guy. And, the, and they walk up. And they so they're, they're dressed up as, as guards to sneak into the, this place. And right before they walk into the place, the guy turns to him and he says, Hey, Lincoln, just so you know, some of the stuff I say when we get inside, you know, you're, you're going to hear some bad stuff in there, whatever. And Lincoln's like, man, I've been hearing it all my life. Don't worry about it. He's like, no, I'm going to have to say things to you to bond with the other guards that is going to, you know, and I just want you to know, it's not how I feel. Like they actually have that conversation before they walk in the that's door. Nice, and then he that's starts a nice story. Beat. And, and then he, well, he walks in and, and the first thing is like, why is this black guy here? And, and the white Lincoln's partner is like, yeah, man, I don't know. There's some affirmative action bullshit where they think black people are supposed to be able to work. So I got to drag this fucker around with me. Yeah. You know, and he bad mouths them and, it's really uncomfortable and weird, uh, but so it's not just like they have racism sort of in in the world, but it's part of the story. It's it's really it's really well done, and the the world they have built, man, the fucking music. The music is the best music I've seen in any one of these open world games because it's all like this late sixties uh, or mid and late sixties. Um, all the music, all this Cle Creedence Clearwater Revival, yeah. um, like all the real bands from the time, and it's fucking fantastic, oh, yeah. dude. I can see that. Uh, sure. And, and so, like the the HUD is not not gr the cars are beautiful, but the HUD is not great. Uh, the gameplay mechanics uh, are not like as optimal as they should be on the PC, especially. But I mean, just how you take cover, especially after playing like Clancy games, the cover mechanic is not great. The missions are repetitive, but it's it's just like the other Mafia games to me, which is that it's a wonderfully written and acted and beautifully realized world that they haven't really fleshed out gameplay wise and with other shit to do. But I still really enjoyed Mafia Two, and so far I'm really enjoying Mafia Three. That's that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty good endorsement thus far. Yeah, I mean it's not and like if I, I can said, pick it's it up for perfect, sixteen but... bucks with DLC included. I will probably do it. And supposedly, I saw a couple people post on our website the DLC. The first DLC already came out, uh, and supposedly it's quite good. And then the next DLC is coming uh, at the end of May, and also looks really interesting. They give you the opportunity to play as one of the other main characters you don't get to play as in the main mm. game. Um, uh, and, and so the so I feel like they're improving in the DLC on the concerns people had with repetitiveness and gameplay uh, in the main game itself. But uh, so far, I'm enjoying it. To, it's certainly to the tune of you know fifteen dollars. Cool, very cool. Yep. Yeah. All right. So the next thing up for me is uh, Thimbleweed Park, which I, I I can't remember if this was on Rock Paper Shock, and I can't remember where I read this, but. There's like a little blurb from a review somewhere, and they said that Thimbleweed Park is the best thing to have come out of Kickstarter, period. And uh, and I I think that that's pretty accurate. It's a if you if you are a fan if you if you know what the Scum Engine is, if you harken back to the glory days of point and click adventures and Maniac Mansion and Monkey Island and Full Throttle and all those terrific LucasArts point and click games. Um, you're going to be right at home here. This is uh, this is done by Ron Gilbert, and uh, and I I I'm terrible with the other guys' names that uh, that he's worked with. Gary Winnick, I think. Yeah, Gary Winnick, and um, it's it is a return to form for the point and click adventure game. It feels exactly like they kind of picked up where they left off with those titles. It's got all of the gameplay uh, tropes and the trappings that you'd expect. It's fantastically fun it's really funny there's great witty dialogue it's very self-aware it's aware of its place in history and so there's a real sense of nostalgia but they also kind of turn that into humor and uh, and neat little story beats and things uh like you know you'll go to pick up something and they're like ah, i probably don't need to pick that up it's probably just an adventure game red herring anyway you know just they they have fun you know within the genre and that kind of stuff um really really uh just neat story that's kind of unfolding, uh, funny characters. Um, it's it's really really tremendously cool. I've played about seventeen hours. I'm stuck as hell right now. I like I know I know in in general terms ex exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, but I can't quite figure out a way to to get there and do it. You know, like I I'm still uh, kind of bumbling around. I've been stuck for about three days trying to get through this uh, 
trying to get through this one location that I know exists, but uh, can't quite reach it. But that's the thing that's fun about the game is that uh, it, it will it will keep you up at night. You'll be laying there and you'll be thinking like, aha, what if I used this thing for my inventory in combination with this? Maybe that would unlock the location. Or maybe I should go and talk to this person because it just dawned on me that, you know, that I remember from a conversation that they had knowledge of that or, you know, like that kind of thing. It's the kind of game that that'll keep you thinking about it constantly and trying to kind of unravel the, the puzzles and stuff madly, madly in love with it. I'm having so much fun. That looks really interesting, man. I, you know, I looked it up and unfortunately it l- looks like it's on everything but the PS4. Uh, um, oh yeah. M- maybe so. I don't know. I'm playing it on PC. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's a game. My wife and I used to play uh, like we played, uh, we used to play point and click adventures together. We played the Siberia games. Dude. And, um, Give it a try. You'd love it. I, I would love to, but but I we would play it on the PS4, so I might have to. I might have to. Uh, I can stream my PC. Yeah, you got to, your Steam uh, Link or whatever, right? I don't have a Steam Link, but I can use my laptop and and Chrome uh, Remote Desktop to play. Right. Um, Do it. Not Chrome. Not Chrome Remote Desktop, but another program. So now I definitely will check this out. It looks looks like a lot of fun. That's awesome. I'm so I had never heard of it till you put it on here. Yeah, dude. It's uh, it's really really good. I crowdfunded it, as did uh, some other people. Uh, one of the features of the game is that if you crowdfunded it at a certain level, okay, so like there's a phone book, you know, like like a public phone book at a phone booth. It's a period game, by the way. It's set in like 87, I think. So uh, payphones still exist is the point that I'm making to you right now. If you crowdfunded it at a certain level, you got your name in the phone book. If you crowdfunded it at a slightly higher level, you got to have your name in the phone book with a number that can actually be dialed on an in-game phone and you'll call and get somebody's voicemail. And I know that Christoph Fatui, he's M- meaning like you can record a voicemail and send it to yes. them. So like, as an example, Fatui, who I play games with almost every day of the week, he crowdfunded it at that level. So like I, I went into the phone book, I find his name, I dial and I hear the voicemail message that he recorded for them. And sent in, and so you know, there's that is honestly one of the most brilliant rewards I've ever heard of. It's fantastic. It, it, like, there's a library, there's a large library in the game, and there's I don't know, you know, dozens, maybe a hundred books in this library, uh, and they're all, you know, they're all just like two pages, may, you know, maybe a few paragraphs at most. Some of them are just you know one or two paragraphs. But the point is, you can pull out these books and read stuff that's in the books, and every bit of it was written by fans who crowdfunded it. At, at a high enough level that they unlock that. And so, you know, they could like, you know, email in whatever they wanted their book title to be and what was going to be in the book. And some of it is just, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's, you know, it's almost like last time on general hospital, you know, it's like this kind of daytime soap opera drama type stuff, or, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it, it might be more of like a, a psychological thriller. It's just like, so interesting to see, you know, what people did with that, that freedom to just write something really quick, some kind of short two paragraph kind of uh, narrative and throw into the game. It's so did you fund to the, you're in the phone book, right? I'm not in the phone book. No, I, I only funded oh, okay. it at the level to get the game. But the, the reason I'm mentioning is that I'm really curious to know if any other outlaws are in the phone book, if they, if they, if they're on the voicemail list, cause I'd love to, uh, to call them in game. And hear their message. It says, I, I, so I was reading the Kickstarter. It says, so for that price point, you get your name in the exclusive Thimblewood in-game phone book, yeah. subject to their approval, of course, because I don't want anything inappropriate. And it says, your name could be the solution to a puzzle. Yeah, which is pretty cool, isn't it? That is so cool, dude. Yeah, I, I really I'm totally turned on by this now. Like, I wish I'd funded it at that higher level. I wish I got my name in the book. That'd have been pretty cool. Do they have any swag for this game? Do you know? Like, I don't uh, know. Uh, little. That's awesome, man. So I, I do want to say for just because I just mentioned it, and I looked it up while you were talking. They, it looks like they are planning on um, putting it out on the PS4, but I guess Xbox has a three month exclusive. Okay. Uh, th- it doesn't say that they're going to put it out. Um, you know, as soon as the three months uh, expires, which the game came out, I believe, on March 30th. Yeah, so it'd be the summer um, when they have the ability to do it. Right, it's the end of June. Um, but it does look they they did say it is their intention to um, to put it on the PS4. So I, that, again, doesn't mean it would be um, doesn't mean it would be in four months, but yeah. uh, it sounds like it will be coming. Tremendous three months, game. I mean, very very. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. I, that looks really awesome. I'm definitely going to check that out. All right, uh, all right. My last um, my last game, Brent. I want to talk about. 
is uh, near Automata. Now, I've not heard um, of this, so I'm very curious to... Oh, you're kidding me. Say. I have not. So Rowan is all over this on the website, yeah. um, as are um, other outlaws. But um, So uh, uh, Rowan's going to kill me because I, I don't really have the background to talk about this game, but it's, it's a Japanese game. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I truly do not know how to describe it, Brent. It is a... Um, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna look up their description of the game because I want to make sure that I describe it right. Okay. So, uh, I I I don't know what it was that caused me to start playing this. I did pay full price for it. I paid like forty eight bucks, but I was just seeing so much of it on the website and so many um so many incredible posts about it. So it says I'm just reading from Wikipedia. Um, is an action role playing video game developed by Platinum Games. Published by Square Enix uh, for uh, PlayStation Four and Windows, it was released in Japan in February. Um, it's a there was it's a sequel to the 2010 video game Near. Um, so uh, it's an action role playing game. I, I don't even know how to describe this game. It's so weird. You have to. I, all I can say is go watch some gameplay videos. It is in- incredibly beautiful. The music uh, is amazing. It, it is ridiculously deep. It's got the interface feels like Metal Gear Solid. The gameplay feels like um, I don't play a lot of these games, so like Metal Gear Rising um, uh, type of you have two like different sword weapons um, and different move sets. The game is, uh, but it's weird because what one of the things that's so special about this game is it moves seamlessly between being a third person action um, role playing game uh, and being a two D side scrolling platformer and being a three D platformer and being a shmup um <laughs> it, it it like goes uh, so so first you're playing cover a you lot know, of ground you're playing metal gear rising and then all of a sudden you're playing um uh um contra or some other you know 2d side scrolling metroid prime and then all of a sudden you're playing um rezogun this is fascinating uh, it's really interesting. It's incredibly beautiful. It's the, the it's gorgeously designed. The dialogue, the world building is fat. And I am so I'm nowhere into this game. I'm seven hours into this game. There are uh, and I'm I'm going to get this wrong, but there's multiple endings for multiple playthroughs. So like you you play through and you get the first ending, I think, and then you play through and get ending B and then ending C, and then you can load. Like uh, an end save and get ending D's and endings D and E and 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 uh, you know Rowan was like, dude, you've got to play through to get ending E. Like they're they're markedly different uh, endings that are meaningful and and uh, uh, I, I, again I I feel like an idiot because I feel like I'm tripping over myself, but I truly don't know how to quantify this game. I don't I don't have enough of the vocabulary from playing Japanese style games, and this game is so unique in the way it seamlessly moves between gameplay types that I've truly never seen anything like it, that I've never seen a game do anything like this successfully to this level. Um, Fascinating. Th- that's really all I can say. I, I really encourage people to go, and it's it's a game that I would never think that I would want to play. I am not into Japanese games at all. Um, I'm, I, and I'm I would at look at some gameplay right now. I'm, I'm I would normally look at a about. game like this and, and think, I, it's, as a matter of fact, I looked at Nier over and over and over and thought, this isn't for me. This isn't for me. This isn't for me. And there's a demo. Uh, so go play the demo. And I played the demo, and I was like, "Done. I'm done. I got. I'm, and I bought the game." Yeah. Um, I highly. I'm playing it on PC using a controller. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was be- just because I wanted that extra bit of beauty. It's just as beautiful on the console for those that are interested. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. It's it's uh, extremely well rated. Video Gamer gave it a nine out of ten. Destructo gave it a nine out of ten. Famitsu gave it a thirty nine out of forty. Um, GameSpot gave it a nine out of ten. I mean, IGN gave it eight point nine out of ten. Um, it, it's it's. I highly, highly encourage you to check it out. Um, Rowan's been posting constantly. Game of the year on Near Automata <laughs> is yeah. the title of the of the gallery that right. she's using. So, um, cool. Uh, I, I highly, highly recommend it, dude. Check it out. I will. All, All right, right. So, so we're gonna go into the sunset. We're gonna go into the sunset. We did structure this like our our old uh, old timey outlaw gamer radio shows. So without without saying it, we did a uh, we started in the garage, moved to the clubhouse, and hit the road. Now we're gonna go out into the sunset. And Brent, for my little into the sunsets, I actually have two of them. Okay, but I'll keep them very brief. They're links to articles. Oh, one's a link to an article. One's a link to a video. 
Um, the first one is uh, called The Nine Best Cell Phones in Games. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an article that was written on Game Informer. Uh, and I just thought it was interesting, Brent. I think people should check it out. It's just an aspect of games that I never really thought of as their own aspect of games. Like how, how you design cell phone use in a video game. Right. Uh, and I just thought it was a really interesting read. I'm not going to go through them here. I just think it's a it's a really interesting uh, topic and something that would be interesting to, you know, even have a, a, a discussion about or, you know, if you were doing something at like a game developers conference or whatever uh, to do, a, to do a, a, a specific presentation on just cell phones and games. Cause they're never really very good. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's meaningful. It's tough because it's a device we're so used to using in our regular lives that we're used to using it like a touch screen. Um, and so trying to use it with control things is always super awkward. And so mm. anyway, I just think it's really interesting. And then uh, the other thing I had here was um, a video from the good old Jack Frags. On how to trigger the megalodon in Battlefield One, and I, did you did you watch the video, Brent? No, I haven't watched this yet. It's fucking hysterical. You have to like get three people to turn valves simultaneously, and then you have to go to where the water fills up in this puddle, and then you have to melee murder three people. Um, and when you do that, then that gets blood in the water, and that calls the shark. It's just hysterical. It's this really complex and awesome Easter egg. That everybody should watch this video. It's just it's beautiful gaming, in my opinion. I wish more games hid things like this in their games. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So anyway, I thought that was really interesting. Well, uh, my end of the sunset topic is also going to be uh, short but sweet. It's a uh, it's a little bit of kit. It's a little device that I think you might want to check out. It's called the Elgato Stream Deck. It's uh, getting ready to come out uh, in theory this month. Amazon says that they're going to start uh, shipping them. On May 15th, but you know, who knows how accurate that is? Only Elgato knows for sure. But in any case, it's going to be coming out really, really soon. And what it is, it's a small little box. It's got 15 buttons, three rows of five. Each of the buttons is an LCD screen. And the intent is for this device to facilitate you live streaming. So there's all kinds of things, you know, while you're live streaming that you're going to be wanting to do while you're live streaming. And this box is designed to make it easy. It's integrated uh, with popular streaming software, obviously Elgato's, but also like, uh, like, like Twitch and OBS, I think. There's, uh, there's commands built right into it. So you can do certain kinds of things. You can swap scenes. You can, uh, you know, you, you can bring up a GIF overlays to, you know, thank people that are donating to you or, you know, to just sort of punctuate a moment of gameplay. You can, uh, you know, like fade on and off uh, your webcam video from the uh, from the gameplay. You can pause and go to some kind of, uh, you know, pause your stream, go to some kind of uh, be right back window and all that. So you can do all this stuff directly from the box and you can do it really easily because as I said, each of the 15 buttons are, uh, are LCD screens, are tiny little LCD screens. So you can, you know, come up with thumbnails. You can overlay text on top of whatever images you choose so you know exactly what that button does. It's no longer a matter of, you know, mousing over to a second monitor and, you know, trying to do something real quick while you're talking and still entertaining your audience. You just glance down, hit the button, and you, uh, you're you rocking and rolling. So that is how the box is intended to be used. However, and what I am really interested in, the software which has gone through a lot of uh, a lot of heavy development you know as they were beta testing this they'd sent some out they had a really active discussion going on with the people who were beta testing these boxes and so the software evolved rapidly through that back and forth process the box is also customizable enough that you can use it for damn near anything so as an example what i'm really interested in is i'm interested in getting a hold of one of these boxes and using it in conjunction with my Adobe Creative Suite software. So now I've got, and each one of these buttons, in addition to performing a function, it could also be a folder. So you can hit it and you basically drop into a folder. And now 14 of the buttons are new programmable buttons. And one of them is like an up button to go back up to the previous folder. So now you have the ability to store presets for the software that you use, because each one of these buttons can be a key combination. It can be a macro. It can launch an application. So I hit a button and now I've got like all my Photoshop shortcuts there on screen. And I've got icons for each of those showing what they do. I launch Premiere. Now I go into my Premiere folder. Now I've got shortcuts for the stuff that I do in Premiere or After Effects or whatever. If you're a programmer and 
you uh, you find yourself you know repetitively hitting certain key combinations within your software to do something. You could map that to this box. You could throw a descriptive icon onto it. You've got it sitting right beside your keyboard. And I think that this box has the potential to really, really speed up creative workflows for those people who do that uh, that creative professional thing on the PC. There's probably applications that I'm not thinking of. You could use it in music production. You could use it all kinds of different ways. I think this thing has so much versatility, so many possibilities. I'm so excited to get mine. I have pre-ordered it. And, uh, and I'm really, really anxious to get a hold of it and try it out. I'm going to be doing some stuff on YouTube and uh, just kind of showing off what it is and how I'm using it. You'll find some videos up there right now. People have been using the, uh, the beta or, you know, like the, uh, the early prototype versions as they were beta testing them. So go check those out if you haven't already. It's $150 US. And the one limitation that everybody thinks of as soon as they see it, and Elgato has said that they cannot do, is uh, you can't do animated icons. That's the only thing. The screens could only show static images with text. But uh, that limitation aside, it's still pretty cool. That sounds really interesting, man. I, I was I, again. I was. I looked it up when you started talking yeah, about it, yeah. and it, it's super configurable. And I'm astounded that way actually that nobody's done that before. Done that before. Exactly. I'm, I'm shocked. Exactly. Like that, that, and that's something. Like I actually described something like this to Tony because I had an application on my iPad. That would that would you know, it was kind of like trying to do the same thing, but it was terrible because it would always like lose connection, like it would never you know like kind of like work or whatever. And mm-hmm. I told Tony, I was like, you know, like the thing is, like you you'd want something like 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 if you had like a like a physical kind of keyboard, like an auxiliary keyboard, but you know, like you had like a screen behind it where like each button could kind of look a certain way or whatever. Uh, or if you ever saw like the old Optimus keyboard, uh, that I can't remember the guy's name. It was, um, but uh, he. He basically like designed this keyboard, and every key was like a tiny little OLED screen. And I think like every key cost like sixteen dollars or something like yeah. that. You know, <laughs> ridiculously expensive. But the point is that like I-, I described something like this to Tony years ago. I'm like, man, like I would love to have you know like like this thing for my iPad, but like it actually worked. And I think the Elgato Stream Deck might be that. I'm super stoked. I, I, I can't. I just can't believe somebody didn't come up with even if you take out the customization or, or ability of it. Just the idea of creating a deck like that specifically geared towards uh, streamers. I think they're going to sell I a mean, few of these things. Yeah, That's at that I price think. point, every single streamer out there is going to buy this. Yeah, and the thing is, I, as opposed to it just being sort of a useless gimmick, I think it will actually improve the, the quality of their streams. It'll allow them to do uh, more professional, uh, more interactive. Uh, it'll, I, I think that it will have a quality of life effect on what they do uh, streaming day in and day out. I think it's going to be Absolutely. Really cool. That's why at $150, it's an absolute no-brainer. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, all right. Well, that brings us to the end of the show, Brent. My God, uh, it only took us like uh, an hour and a half to get here. Yeah, we gave you guys a long show. This is so- uh, sorry or you're welcome. I'm not sure, depending <laughs> on what your perspective is. Uh, when we don't record for a while, I think our to- shows tend to be longer like this. So It's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, as we said, I, you know, we will be doing some form of E3 coverage. We don't know what it is, so we'll let you know when we do. Um, but that's just a month away, and in the meantime, uh, maybe you can get through this show in that time. <laughs> uh, as always, we want to hear it's more as or more. But it's more important to us to hear what you guys think about all these topics. We love uh, that you, that the site is still going strong and people are talking on the site. I'm there every single day of the week. Um, Definitely. At least for a minute. It's New York Times and Outlaw Gamers uh, Society where I go to. But I get all of my gaming news from you guys. Honestly, I don't. I honestly don't go really look at other websites unless we you link out to them. So why would you need uh, to? I just I just love uh, I love it. So please chime in as always. Your conversation is the conversation. Let us know what you think about the Stream Deck, uh, about triggering the Megalodon in Battlefield One, about the nine best cell phones in games or other cell phones. I'm really curious to hear. Uh, what people say about that. Also, uh, any of the games we talked about in uh, the unannounced on the road section, uh, such as Near Automata, um, Thimbleweed Park, Mafia 3 Helldivers, or Ghost Recon Wildlands, uh, up in the middle section of the show, we talked a little bit about E3 and the E3 preview. Please, we want to know what you're looking forward to E3 and what your predictions are. And then, of course, uh, at the beginning of the show, we talked about the most important thing of the year, the Red Dead Redemption 2 trailer. Uh, also pray for those of you that are playing we want to hear about that and any other games you didn't play this year um, that you thought you would but chose not to uh, we'd like to hear about those as well and any topics you have please feel free to include that in the conversation in the comments 
We love to hear what you're saying. Brent, it has been a joy as always. Yes, it has. And remember, guys, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. <laughs>